Hello, welcome back to chapter one of Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything and we'll be reading How to Build a Universe and I'll just talk briefly about the introduction while we let um, whoever needs to come in, come in. Hello again Julie and again for those watching live and who are here this evening working through the chapters, apologies that we have to keep stopping and starting the stream, but for people who find the playlist later on and want to just work through the book, even though there's going to be lots of me talking in between, <laughs> they'll have to suffer that. Um, and I'll just speak briefly about the introduction. Very thought-provoking. Bill Bryson starts by saying... What a miracle it is that life exists at all. What a doubly miracle it is that we have the planet Earth that life can survive on. And what a trebly miracle it is that you and I are here, alive, today. All the miracles that have gone together so that we can just be here. Me talking, you listening is an absolute wonder. And so everyone's coming in now. And I'll begin the chapter shortly, but there's a, a second part that really stood out for me, and that is the learning. Bill Bryson says he he's studied and read and conducted interviews for three years to be able to write this book. And I mentioned at the end of the last dream how, I'm not going to repeat it here because I've just said it, but if you want to learn, you buy a few books, read them, and you're understanding will completely update and your knowledge will grow vastly. So we're going to be reading How to Build a Universe. Like the video, subscribe to the channel if you're not yet and maybe share the show on your social media to help the channel grow and develop. And so this is part one, Lost in the Cosmos and chapter one, How to Build a Universe. No matter how hard you try, you will never be able to grasp just how tiny, how spatially unassuming is a proton. It is just way too small. A proton is an infinitesimal part of an atom, which itself, of course, which is itself, of course, an insubstantial thing. Protons are so small that a little dib of ink, like the dot on this eye, can hold something in the region of five billion, five hundred billion, or five hundred million. Sorry, my maths is not up to date. Hannah, any idea? Five hundred billion. You reckon? Five hundred billion of them, or rather more than the number of seconds it takes to make half a million years. So protons are exceedingly microscopic, to say the very least. And Bill Bryson has a wonderful way of this, sort of, if I say 500 billion, it's difficult for the mind to grasp, unless you're a mathematician, it's difficult to grasp these great numbers. And so he does a wonderful job of saying, um, uh, you know, or rather more than the number of seconds it takes to make half a million years. And sorry, I missed out the chat. Hello again, Julie. Kathy, hello there. Chandra Green, welcome. And Nikos, sorry, I missed you at the end of the last stream. And V Bailey asked, would this be suitable for my son's home education? He's coming up nine years. And um, yes, V Bailey, for sure. I have my daughter Hannah here sitting with me this evening. And she's coming up on nine years also. So she's here listening. It's causing her provoking of thought or the provoking of thought in my young daughter. And it should provoke thought in all of us. So I'd say, yes, of course. Um, yeah, I'd say for any age, this is wonderful. Back to the story. Now imagine if you can, and of course you can't, shrinking one of those protons down to a billionth of its normal size into a space so small that it would make a proton look enormous. Now pack into that tiny, tiny space about an ounce of matter. Excellent. You are ready 
to start a universe. Goodness me. I'll read that again because, again, boggles the mind. You can't, you can't get your head around it like he says. Now imagine if you can, brackets, and of course you can't, close brackets, shrinking one of those protons down to a, a billionth of its normal size into a space so small that it would make a proton look enormous. Now pack into that tiny, tiny space about an ounce of matter. Excellent. You're ready to start a universe. I know. Woo! I'm assuming, of course, that you wish to build an inflationary universe. If you'd prefer instead to build a more old-fashioned, standard Big Bang universe, you'll need additional materials. In fact, you will need to gather up everything there is, every last moat and particle of matter between here and the edge of creation, and squeeze it into a spot so infinitesimally compact that it has no dimensions at all. It is known as a singularity. <laughs> In either case, get ready for a really big bang. Naturally, you will wish to retire to a safe place to observe the spectacle. Unfortunately, there is nowhere to retire to because outside the singularity, there is nowhere. When the universe begins to expand, it won't be spreading out to fill a larger emptiness. The only space that exists is the space it creates as it goes. It is natural but wrong to visualize the singularity as a kind of pregnant dot hanging in a dark, boundless void. But there is no space, no darkness. The singularity has no around around it. There is no space for it to occupy, no place for it to be. We can't even ask how long it has been there, whether it has just lately popped into being like a good idea, or whether it has been there forever, quietly awaiting the right moment. Time doesn't exist. There is no past for it to emerge from. And so, from nothing, our universe begins. In a single blinding pulse, a moment of glory much too swift and expansive for any form of words, the singularity assumes heavenly dimensions, space beyond conception. The first lively second, a second that many cosmologists will devote careers to shaving into ever finer wafers, produces gravity and the other forces that govern physics. In less than a minute, the universe is a million billion bows of miles across and growing fast. There is a lot of heat now, 10 billion degrees of it, enough to begin the nuclear reactions that create the lighter elements, principally hydrogen and helium, with a dash, about one atom in a hundred million of lithium. In three minutes, 98% of all the matter there is or will ever be has been produced. We have a universe. It is a place of the most wondrous and gratifying possibility, and beautiful too. And it was all done in about the time it takes to make a sandwich. When this moment happened is a matter of some debate. Cosmologists have long argued over whether the moment of creation was 10 billion years ago, or twice that, or something in between. The consensus seems to be heading for a figure of about 13.7 billion years, but these things are notoriously difficult to measure, as we shall see further on. All that can really be said is that at some indeterminate point in the very distant past, for some reasons unknown, there came the moment known to science as T equals zero. We were on our way. And if anyone is a cosmologist who knows what T equals zero means, let us know in the chat. <laughs> There is, of course, a great deal we don't know, and much of what we think we know we haven't known or thought we've known for long. Okay, so I'll read that sentence again because, yeah. There is, of course, a great deal we don't know, and much of what we think we know we haven't known or thought we've known for long. Even the notion of the Big Bang is quite a recent one. The idea had been kicking around since the 1920s, when Georges Lemaitre, a Belgian priest scholar, first tentatively proposed it. But it didn't really become an active notion in cosmology until the mid-1960s, when two young radio astronomers made an extraordinary and inadvertent discovery. So that's a rather simple throwaway sentence, but 
again, I haven't, I don't, I haven't retained all of the facts in this book. Of course, it's been twenty years, like I say, maybe a little bit less. But the idea of the Big Bang came about only as late as the nineteen twenties, with uh, Georges Lemaitre, and didn't really become um, an active notion until the nineteen sixties. So fascinating stuff. Eh? You think, or I think, we think. People have a tendency to think that these ideas have always been around. The Big Bang has always been an idea, has always been a concept. Their names were Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson. In 1964, they were trying to make use of a large communications antenna owned by Bell Labor Laboratories at Holmdel, New Jersey, but they were troubled by a persistent background noise, a steady, steamy hiss that made any experimental work impossible. The noise was unrelenting and unfocused. It came from every point in the sky, day and night, through every season. For a year, the young astronomers did everything they could think of to track down and eliminate the noise. They tested every electrical system. They rebuilt instruments, checked circuits, wiggled wires, dusted plugs. <laughs> they climbed into the dish and placed duct tape over every seam and rivet. They climbed back into the dish with brooms and scrubbing brushes and carefully swept it clean of what they referred to in a later paper as white dielectric material, or what is known more commonly as bird shit. <laughs> Excuse me. Nothing they tried worked. Unknown to them, just 50 kilometres away at Princeton University, a team of scientists led by Robert Dyke was working on how to find the very thing they were trying so diligently to get rid of. The Princeton researchers were pursuing an idea that had been suggested in the 1940s by the Russian-born astrophysicist George Gamow. That if you look deep enough into space, you should find some cosmic background radiation left over from the Big Bang. Gamow calculated that by the time it had crossed the vastness of the cosmos, the radiation would reach Earth in the form of microwaves. In a more recent paper, he had even suggested an instrument that might do the job, the Bell Antenna at Holmdel. Unfortunately, neither Penzias and Wilson nor any of the Princeton team had read Gamow's paper. The noise that Penzias and Wilson were hearing was, of course, the noise that Gamow had postulated. They had found the edge of the universe, or at least the visible part of it, 90 billion trillion miles away. They were seeing the first photons, the most ancient light in the universe, though time and distance had converted them to microwaves, just as Gamow had predicted. In his book, The Inflationary Universe, Alan Guth provides an analogy that helps to put this finding into perspective. If you think of peering into the depths of the universe as like looking down from the hundredth floor of the Empire State Building, with the hundredth floor representing now and street level representing the moment of the Big Bang, at the time of Wilson and Penzias's discovery, the most distant galaxies anyone had ever detected were on about the 60th floor, and the most distant things, quasars, were on about the 20th. Penzias and Wilson's finding pushed our acquaintance with the visible universe to within half an inch of the lobby floor. Oh yeah. Sorry, H Hannah's got a different edition. It would seem. Um, mine. Um, what does your final sentence say? Within half an inch of the sidewalk. Yeah. And mine says to within half an inch of the lobby floor. So maybe that's an American edition, and this is a, an English edition. Who knows? Still unaware of what caused the noise, Wilson and Penzias phoned Dyke at Princeton and described their problem to him in the hope that he might suggest a solution. Dyke realised at once what the two young men had found. Well, boys, we've just been scooped, he told his colleagues as he hung up the phone. 
Soon afterwards, the Astrophysical Journal published two articles, one by Penzias and Wilson describing their exper experience with the Hiss, the other by Dyke's team explaining its nature. Although Penzias and Wilson had not been looking for cosmic background radiation, didn't know what it was when they had found it, and hadn't described or interpreted its character in any paper, they received the 1978 Nobel Prize in Physics. The Princeton researchers got only sympathy. According to Dennis Overby, or Overby, in Lonely Hearts of the Cosmos, neither Penzias nor Wilson altogether understood the significance of what they had found until they read about it in the New York Times. Incidentally, disturbance from cosmic background radiation is something we have all experienced. Tune your television to any channel it doesn't receive and about 1% of the dancing static you see is accounted for by this ancient remnant of the Big Bang. The next time you complain that there is nothing on, remember that you can always watch the birth of the universe. Although everyone calls it the Big Bang, many books caution us not to think of it as an explosion in the conventional sense. It was rather a vast sudden expansion on a whopping scale. So what caused it? One notion is that perhaps the singularity was the relic of an earlier collapsed universe that ours is just one of an eternal cycle of expanding and collapsing universes like the bladder on an oxygen machine. Others attribute the Big Bang to what they call a false vacuum or a scalar field or vacuum energy some quality or thing at any rate that introduced a measure of instability into the nothingness that was. It seems impossible that you could get something from nothing, but the fact that once there was nothing and now there is a universe is evident proof that you can. It may be that our universe is merely part of many larger universes, some in different dimensions, and that big bangs are going on all the time, all over the place. Or it may be that space and time had some other forms altogether before the Big Bang, forms too alien for us to imagine. And that the Big Bang represents some sort of transition phase, where the universe went from a form we can't understand to one we almost can. These are very close to religious questions, Dr. Andre Lind, a cosmologist at Stanford, told the New York Times in 2001. The Big Bang Theory isn't about the bang itself, but about what happened after the Big Bang. Not long after, mind you. By doing a lot of maths and watching carefully what goes on in particle accelerators, scientists believe they can look back to 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the moment of creation, when the universe was still so small that you would have needed a microscope to find it. We mustn't swoon over every extraordinary number that comes before us, but it is perhaps worth latching on to one from time to time just to be reminded of their ungraspable and amazing breath. Thus, 10 to the minus 43 is... There's a lot of zeros. Let's see if you can see where are we. Here. Can you see all them zeros? Or one ten million trillion trillion trillionths of a second. Hello there, LTEL, welcome. And so just to get our heads around it, of course we all have the concept of second, one second, half a second, point one of a second, you know, if you ever watch swimming races or running races on the um, TV, you know, 0 0.01 of a second and even 0 0.001 if it's very close, right, if the runners cross the line at the same time. But this is 1 10 million trillion trillion trillionths of a second. So a very short period of time. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, hey, Eltel's uh, 
racing ahead of us. Yeah, we'll begin on uh, a week tomorrow, El Tel. A week Monday we'll begin, and I'm looking forward to it. Most of what we know, or believe we know, about the early moments of the universe is thanks to an idea called inflation theory, first propounded in 1979 by a junior particle physicist then at Stanford, now at MIT, named Alan Guth. He was 32 years old and, by his own admission, had never done anything much before. He would probably never have had his great theory except that he happened to attend a lecture on the Big Bang given by none other than Robert Dyke. The lecture inspired Guth to take an interest in cosmology and in particular in the birth of the universe. Like what I was saying, right? If any of these chapters or sections call out to you like they did to Guth, you can buy a few books or if you want, take a course. The eventual result was the inflation theory which holds that a fraction of a moment after the dawn of creation, the universe unwent, underwent a sudden dramatic expansion. It inflated, in effect ran away with itself, doubling in size every 10 to the minus 34 seconds. The whole episode may have lasted no more than 10 to the minus 30 seconds. That's one million, 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 million millionths of a second. But it changed the universe from something you could hold in your hand to something at least 10... Any idea? 10 quadrillion? No. Nine sets of zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six. No, eight, ten, and eight thousand. So, I don't know. Million, billion, trillion, quadrillion. Uh, I don't know what, what goes higher, so I don't know the numbers. Forgive me. Inflation theory explains the ripples and eddies that make our universe possible. Without it, there would be no clumps of matter and thus no stars, just drifting gas and everlasting darkness. According to Guth's theory, at one ten millionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, gravity emerged. After another ludicrously brief interval, it was joined by electromagnetism and the strong and weak nuclear forces, the stuff of physics. These were joined an instant later by shoals of elementary particles, the stuff of stuff. From nothing at all, suddenly there were swarms of photons, protons, electrons, neutrons and much else, between 10 to the 79th and 10 to the 89th of each, according to the standard Big Bang Theory. Such quantities are, of course, ungraspable. It is enough to know that in a single cracking instant we were endowed with a universe that was vast, at least a hundred billion light years across according to the theory, but possibly any size up to infinite and perfectly arrayed for the creation of stars, galaxies and other complex systems. What is extraordinary from our point of view is how well it turned out for us. If the universe had formed just a tiny bit differently, Hello there, Todd Malone. Welcome to the stream. How are you? This is powerful, this bit as well. I think I remember this bit about the, um, what's it called? The zone or something. The, uh, uh, the Goldilocks zone, maybe. Let's see what he calls it. What is extraordinary from our point of view is how well it turned out for us. If the universe had formed just a tiny bit differently, if gravity were fractionally stronger or weaker, if the expansion had proceeded just a little more slowly or swiftly, then there might never have been stable elements to make you and me and the ground we stand on. Had gravity been a trifle stronger, the universe itself might have collapsed like a badly erected tent without precisely the right values to give it the necessary dimensions and density and component parts. Had it been weaker, however, nothing would have coalesced. The universe would have remained forever a dull, scattered void. Hello, Drew, Carter and Sonny. Welcome. The Shady Family. Or maybe that's not your surname, forgive me if it's not, but welcome you guys. Hi. 
getting educated by Bill Bryson and having fun on, along the way. This is one reason why some experts believe that there may have been many other Big Bangs, perhaps trillions and trillions of them, spread through the mighty span of eternity, and that the reason we exist in this particular one is that this is one that we could exist in. As Edward P. Tr Tryon of Columbia University once put it, in answer to the question of why it happened, I offered the modest proposal that our universe is simply one of those things which happen from time to time. To which adds Guth, although the creation of a universe might be very unlikely, Tryon emphasised that no one had encountered the failed attempts. Martin Rees, Britain's Astronomer Royal, believes that there are many universes, possibly an infinite number, each with different attributes in different combinations, and that we simply live in one that combines things in the way that allows us to exist. He makes an analogy with a very large clothing store. If there is a large stock of clothing, you're not supposed to find a suit that fits. Or, sorry, if there is a large stock of clothing, you're not surprised to find a suit that fits. If there are many universes, each governed by a differing set of numbers, there will be one where there is a particular set of numbers suitable to life. We are in that one. Rees maintains that six numbers in particular govern our universe, and that if any of these values were changed even very slightly, things could not be as they are. For example, for the universe to exist as it does requires that hydrogen be converted to helium in a precise but comparatively stately manner, specifically in a way that converts seven one sa in a way that converts seven one <laughs> can't talk <laughs> in a way that converts seven one thousandths of its mass to energy. Lower than that value very slightly, from 0.07% to 0.06%, say, and no transformation could take place. The universe would consist of hydrogen and nothing else. Raise the value very slightly to 0.08%, and bonding would be so wildly prolific that the hydrogen would long since have been exhausted. In either case, with the slightest tweaking of the numbers, the universe as we know and need it, would not be here. <clears throat> I should say, I should say that everything is just right so far. Hey, Jean Green, me too. We've got a Two more chapters coming up after this one, so yeah, stick around, guys. <clears throat> I should say that everything is just right so far. In the long term, gravity may turn out to be a little too strong. One day it may halt the expansion of the universe and bring it collapsing in upon itself until it crushes itself down into another singularity, possibly to start the whole process over again. On the other hand, it may be too weak, in which case the universe will keep racing away forever until everything is so far apart that there is no chance of material interactions so that the universe becomes a place that is very roomy but inert and dead. The third option is that gravity is perfectly pitched, critical density is the cosmologist's term for it, and that it will hold the universe together at just the right dimensions to allow things to go on indefinitely. Cosmologists, in their lighter moments, sometimes call this the Goldilocks effect. I was right, I did remember that everything is just right. For the record, these three possible universes are known respectively as closed, open and flat. And so, yeah, just briefly, a brief comment, just like in the introductory chapter, the miracles that came that life on planet Earth can exist and that I can be here reading and you here listening. Now, the Goldilocks effect the Goldilocks effect that the fact that physics is what it is is, um, again, 
more miracles. Now, the question that has occurred to all of us at some point is, what would happen if you travelled to the edge of the universe and, as it were, put your head through the curtains? <laughs> Where would your head be if it were no longer in the universe? What would you find beyond? The answer, disappointingly, is that you can never get to the edge of the universe. That's not because it would take too long to get there, though of course it would, but because even if you travelled outward and outward in a straight line, indefinitely and pugnaciously, you would never arrive at an outer boundary. Instead, you would come back to where you began, at which point, presumably, you would rather lose heart in the exercise and give up. The reason for this is that the universe bends, in a way we can't adequately imagine, in conformance with Einstein's with Einstein's theory of relativity, which we will get to in due course. For the moment it is enough to know that we are not adrift in some large ever-expanding bubble, rather space curves in a way that allows it to be boundless but finite. Space cannot even properly be said to be expanding because, as the physicist and Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg notes, solar systems and galaxies are not expanding and space itself is not expanding. Rather, the galaxies are rushing apart. It is all something of a challenge to intuition or, as the biologist J.B.S. Haldane once famously observed, the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, it is queerer than we can suppose. The analogy that is usually given for explaining the curvature of space is to try to imagine someone from a universe of flat surfaces who had never seen a sphere being brought to Earth. No matter how far he roamed across the planet's surface, he would never find an edge. He might eventually return to the spot where he had started, and would of course be utterly confounded to explain how that had happened. Well, we are in the same position in space as our puzzled flatlander, only we are flummoxed by a higher dimension. And this is interesting because in we read uh, chapter 10, I think, of Gurdjieff's In Search of the Miraculous, or chapter 11, I, I think it was chapter 10 or 11, say, and he talks about dimensions at the end there, and um, here we're talking about dimensions, but this is an esoteric metaphysics like in search of the miraculous is this is just science so very interesting just as there is no place where you can find the edge of the universe so there is no place where you can stand at the center and say this is where it all began this is the center most point of it all we are all at the center of it all actually we don't know that for sure we can't prove it mathematically Scientists just assume that we can't really be the center of the universe. Think what that would imply, but that the phenomenon must be the same for all observers in all places. Still, we don't actually know. For us, the universe goes only as far as light has traveled in the billions of years since the universe was formed. This visible universe, the universe we know and can talk about, is a million, 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 million miles across. But according to most theories, the universe at large, the meta-universe, as it is sometimes called, is vastly roomier still. According to Rees, the number of light years to the edge of this larger, unseen universe would be written not with ten zeros, not even with a hundred, but with millions. In short, there's more space than you can imagine already, without going to the trouble of trying to envision some additional beyond. For a long time, the Big Bang Theory had one gaping hole that troubled a lot of people, namely, that it couldn't begin to explain how we got here. Although 98% of all the matter that exists was created with the Big Bang, that matter consti consisted exclusively of light gases, the helium, hydrogen and lithium that we mentioned earlier. Not one particle of the heavy stuff so vital to our own being, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, oxygen, and all the rest emerged from the gaseous brew of creation. But, and here's the troubling point, to forge these heavy elements you need the kind of heat and energy thrown off by a Big Bang. Yet there has been only one Big Bang, and it didn't produce them. So where did they come from? 
Interesting. Interestingly, the man who found the answer to that question was a cosmologist who heartily despised the Big Bang theory, the Big Bang as a theory, and coined the term Big Bang sarcastically as a way of mocking it. <laughs> so that's interesting. This term that we have, the Big Bang, was coined by a man who was taking the mick. And, you know, someone said, oh, yeah, that sounds really good. We'll get to him shortly, but before we turn to the question of how we got here, it might be worth taking a few minutes to consider just where exactly here is. And so, again, guys, we're going to shut this stream down, just hang around on YouTube or the Book Club channel, and we'll come back with Chapter 2, Welcome to the Solar System, and we're going to learn about how we go from the primordial beginnings of the universe to galaxies and solar systems. So, um, yeah, call it ten past nine, four minutes. We will begin the next chapter, chapter two, Welcome to the Solar System. Again, apologies for these stopping and starting, but as I said before, and maybe I'll say again before the end of the playlist, it's for people that come later on so that they can jump between the chapters. So I'll see you in about three minutes over on the new stream. See you there.